I'd like to begin with a question. Why the heck is a rabbi talking about Batman? I should be involved with spirituality and not spandex. To answer the question, I'll have to make a confession. Not that rabbis usually confess, but unlike many of my rabbinical contemporaries, I did not grow up religious, observant, orthodox, Hasidic, Chabad, for want of a better word, I grew up normal. <laughs> I'm from Manchester, England, and growing up in Manchester, religion was spiritual valium. It was something that others needed to get answers to existential questions in life that really had no answers. I was a superhero zealot, and a degree in film history led to a job scouting movie locations. Yet to quote the old Yiddish proverb, man plans, God laughs. Seeking to fulfill needs not met by MTV and materialism, I became a rabbi. <laughs> like you do. Uh, today, I chair the Religious Affairs Committee at the renowned New York Art School Pratt Institute. When I first became the rabbi of Pratt, I tried all the traditional rabbinic shtick, Sabbath, kosher, holiday. I still try, and students would say to me, Rabbi Simcha, you're a great guy, you're funny, dynamic, erudite, extremely handsome. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but this, this is art school. Ironically, at Pratt, I found myself at the very same school that many comic book pioneers once attended. And I started to reread the classic superhero comics of my youth, this time through the lens of Jewish tradition and spirituality. I wrote my first book, Up, Up, and Oive. <laughs> uh, it was a direct collaboration over copious bowls of chicken soup at three o'clock in the morning with my students. The premise of the book being that every single major figure that has created the all-American superhero was Jewish. In fact, you can even say, if a person's name ends in man, they're either Jewish, Lippmann, Feldman, Goldman, or a superhero, Superman. <laughs> I'm not even gonna finish that. Which begs the obvious question, why do Jews create superheroes? The answer is sad, succinct, and simple. The late 1930s were arguably the most anti-Semitic period in American history. Many Ivy League schools kept a quota on the number of Jews allowed, country clubs, and even some neighborhoods barred Jews altogether. Comic books were in their infancy. They were the lowest rung on the artistic food chain. There was no barriers to entry. Through the prism of Jewish storytelling and the immigrant experience, comic book creators infused their creations with a particularly Jewish worldview. Take Superman, the creation of two Jews, Jerry Siegel, and Joseph Schuster from Cleveland, Ohio, in Superman number two from 1939. Superman is sent to an unnamed European location. He meets Adolphus Runyon, a thinly veiled metaphor for Hitler. He's put in an ancient pillared room. Superman knocks the pillars and shouts, a man named Samson once tried to do this. Here you see young immigrant Jews tapping into a storytelling tradition rich in biblical archetypes. After all, writers write about what they know about. Also, consider the Jewish immigrant experience. Many comic book creators came from unassimilated Yiddish-speaking homes. They had one identity at home, another identity at work. They create characters who themselves have one identity at home, another identity at work. Think about Batman's creator, Bob Kane was born Robert Kahn, Captain America's creator. Jack Kirby was born Jacob Kurtzberg. Stan Lee, the man behind everything, was born <laughs> Stanley Lieber. It's no wonder Pulitzer Prize winning author Michael Scheibon once noted it's impossible not to see these things as allegorical of the Jewish immigrant experience. Also consider patriotism. Six months before Pearl Harbor, thrusting America into World War II, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon had taken matters into their own hands with Captain America. The front cover of Captain America number one sees Captain America smashing Hitler across the face, knocking the Fuhrer to the ground, it's cute, 
It's funny, it's nostalgic. Could you imagine coming from immigrant Jews who were getting wretching letters home from their families in the old country? What a powerful portrayal of wish fulfillment this must have been. The end of World War II saw a brief decline in the popularity of superheroes. After all, peacetime proved bad for business. But by the swinging 60s, superheroes had evolved. They became complex, ambiguous, flawed and reluctant with their own angst and insecurities to deal with. In 1961, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby create a different type of superhero. They create a family of superheroes called the Fantastic Four. One particular character called The Thing, who has a rock-like substance over his body, was very Jewish from the beginning. In fact, in the comics, The Thing's name is Benjamin Jacob Grimm. Can there be a more Jewish-sounding name than <laughs> Benjamin Jacob? Jack Kirby was born Jacob, named after the famous patriarch who spends the night wrestling an angel. In the comics, The Thing grows up on Yancey Street, a very thinly veiled nod to the iconography of the tenements of Delancey Street. In a 2002 edition, The Thing goes back to Yancey Street and his Semitic roots are revealed. He sees Mr. Shekerberg, who he thinks has died. The Thing stands over him and says the Shema, the most famous of all Jewish prayers. He opens the F of the Fantastic Four belt buckle. He pulls out a Magin David, a Star of David necklace. Like so many of his American tribesmen, the thing hid his Jewish roots in order to avoid confrontation. Ironically, Manhattan's cosmic comic put a sign in the window after the issue was released asking, how do you circumcise an orange brick? Google it. <laughs> Another reoccurring theme we see is the Jewish immigrant experience. In 1962, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby collaborate on The Incredible Hulk. Hulk's a metaphor for many things. Cuban Missile Crisis, fear of genetic mutation, the atomic bomb. He's also based on the Golem, the famous monster hero from 16th century Prague, created to defend the Jewish community from pogrom. Interestingly, in the 70s, they write an issue called In the Shadow of the Golem, where the Hulk is mistaken to be the Golem. Another reoccurring theme we see is the Holocaust. Whilst earlier generations of comic book creators grappled with the Holocaust, later generations grapple with the aftermath. In 1963, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby collaborate on the most serious comic of them all. It's not a solitary superhero, not a dynamic duo, not a fantastic foursome, but an entire race of superheroes called the X-Men. And who better to base that race on than their own people, the Jewish people? We can see a tragic Holocaust connection in the character of Magneto, the anti-hero who in the comics has to help the Nazis kill his own family to stay alive. That makes him a tragic, yet somehow understandable anti-hero. In the 80s, the X-Men introduce the Jewish character of Kitty Pride, who lights a Yortzeit remembrance candle when her fellow mutant and sometimes boyfriend Colossus is killed. I'm not sure what Halacha says when your mutant alien boyfriend is killed. That's above my pay grade. Make a great Eli talk. Finally, in closing, I'd like to ask a very simple question. Is Superman Jewish? No one knows more about this than I do because no one is as meshuggah enough as to think about this as much as I have. We know his creators were Jewish. We know he's based on an, on an assimilated archetype. However, he's also based on Moses. For those of you that were awake during Sunday school, you may remember the story. Egypt faces internal implosion. Moses is put in a reed basket. He's sent away, grows up in a foreign culture, foreign land. The house of Pharaoh becomes the savior of humanity. Watch the story of Superman. Krypton faces internal implosion. Baby Kal El, which is Hebrew for the voice or vessel of God, is put in a little rocket pod. He's sent away to a foreign culture, 
Foreign land grows up in a Midwestern cornfield with the Kent family and becomes the savior of humanity. The suffix L being one of the names of God used in the Bible. It's also the name of the prophets, Michael, Daniel, Emmanuel. Tragically, the story happened for real. In the late 30s, early 40s, as young Jewish children were being shepherded on to Kindertransport, sent away to live in safety as the old country imploded with families in England. So, the question, is Superman, or for that matter, any superhero Jewish? The answer is a loud, clear, resounding, emphatic, no. <laughs> Jews are not superheroes, and superheroes are not Jewish. However, superhero values are Jewish values. So next time you're chewing on the popcorn, watching Star Spangled, Star Spangled Salvation in 3D, of course, <laughs> remember the following. Every single one of us hides behind an assimilated archetype, a mild-mannered Clark Kent. But go out into the world without any masks. Be Jupiter heroes in spandex or not. Thank you. The story is told of three men lost, wandering through a desert. One of the men is Russian, another one is a Frenchman, and the third man is a Jewish man. They're wandering through this desolate desert, and the Russian man says, my throat is dry, I'm thirsty, I wish I had vodka. The Frenchman says, my throat is dry, I'm thirsty, I wish I had champagne. And the Jewish man says, my throat is dry, I'm thirsty, I probably have diabetes. <laughs> that is a joke that I think works with almost every demography of the Jewish people because it says something about us and our culture. <laughs>